I had forgotten that we are competing today with the Delray Arts Festival or something downtown. So for those of you who wanted to go and fight for a parking spot, I thank you for coming here instead. I promise you, you won't be disappointed. Um, As always, we would like to thank our office staff and the Adams family, not the ones that were on TV, for their production assistance. For this seventh lecture of the year, and you will remember we started, I think, with five lectures one year, went to six. This year we're doing eight lectures. Um, we started a month later this year. We gave up our first lecture to the men's club, and so we have been rewarded by having an extra lecture uh, in the spring, okay? We'd like to particularly start by thanking the Salkoff family, uh, the sponsor of our Sundays at Sinai program in memory of their late husband, father, and grandfather, in whose memory the Jerome Ira Salkoff Memorial Fund was established uh, and to advance ad adult education here at Temple Sinai. Pardon me while I put my glasses on, a concession to older age. It is with great pleasure that I'm going to introduce to you and acquaint you today with someone that you may already know. Uh, Scott Salkoff is a Florida Bar Certified Specialist in Elder Law. He's an alumni of the University of Florida, and he graduated cum laude on a Goodwin Fellowship from Nova Southeastern University Law School. He is a fellow of the American College of Trusts and a state council and has served as chair of the Florida Bar Elder Law Section, president of the Academy of Florida Elder Law Attorneys, has served on the board of directors of the Florida State Guardianship Association, the National Academy of Elder Law Attorneys, the Alpert Jewish Family and Child Services, as Vice President of the Mandel JCC and on the Board of Trustees of the Florida Council on Aging. I need to take a breath. As if that's not enough to keep him occupied, Scott has served on several government panels, think tanks, and task forces by appointment of the Governor of the State of Florida, the Florida Senate, and the Attorney General. He has been written up on national media, including the National Public Radio, the Washington Post, which I subscribe to, the Wall Street Journal, Kiplinger's Magazine, etc., and has co-authored a 1,000-page Elder Law Practice Guide. As if this isn't enough, for those of you who come to Temple regularly, you may note that across the um, driveway on our entrance to the temple is a large yellow southern looking building. For any of you who want to speak to Scott privately, that's where his office is. His life's work has always been the protection of the elderly and disabled, their caregivers, and their families. At this point, I will desist from extolling any more of Scott's many attributes and turn the floor over to him. Thank you. Thank you, Esther. Actually, keep going, please. Hi, everybody. I, I, I do get to speak a lot, usually to other lawyers, so it's always a pleasure when I'm not, <laughs> the, uh, when I'm not speaking to other lawyers. I will tell you, though, that this is a great honor uh, in particular because you, we have here the Jerome Myra Solkoff Memorial Fund that helps to make Sundays at Sinai happen, and it's not a coincidence that we have the same last name. That is my, my father um, of blessed memory, who is one of the founders of the Elder Law section of Florida Bar, uh, wrote the first book on Elder Law for lawyers. Um, so when we say Scott's the co-author, it's his book. Um, I've taken it over with, with great honor. So it makes it extra special for me to be here today. And also, as you know, I'm a loyal member of Temple Sinai. So. Yeah, it's a, it's a great group. So what I'll do today is, I, I do have a PowerPoint, but I, I would like to keep this. We have a relatively small group. Let's, let's make it more of a discussion. Uh, it doesn't have to be just a speech. Um, and I, I do have an agenda, and I want to get through it for you, because I think that's important. I think I know what you need to hear today. 
but I will um, open it up for questions and thoughts as I go and I'll pause at different parts so that we can do that. It sounds sound good? Good, good, good. Because you may already have questions. So I'm going to start off just by defining some terms, just so that we have a sense of, of, of words that you know and have heard, but how I'm going to use them today may be a little different. Hold on one sec. All right, bear with me. Okay. And actually, while I'm doing this, if I could ask for a couple volunteers, I have these as handouts too, so that you, if you'd like, you can take some notes. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. So basics. We all know what a will is, right? A will is where we put down our wishes for what happens after we die, how we give away our stuff. How we, how we let everything go according to our wishes. But really, what's interesting about wills that I didn't know until I started practicing in this area is that a will legally is nothing more than a piece of paper with writing on it. It's given no legal effect until what? Until you die, right? It means nothing while you're alive. It does nothing for you. It's given no legal effect. But immediately upon death, it can be made to be uh, a, a legally enforceable document. But in order for that to happen, another step has to occur. What's that called? Probate. So in order for that will to be given any legal effect, it has to go through a judicial process called probate. What's probate mean? It means proof in Latin. right? So we're proving up the will. And the court is saying, yes. This is the will of Scott Solkoff or whomever. And then things get distributed after the court approves it. And after another process, which is giving creditors an opportunity to come forward, making sure that everybody has an opportunity to be heard. If you have a question or comment or a contest regarding the will, this is your chance to come forward or forever hold your peace. Quite literally, because there's a statute of limitations that says this is when you must come forward, and if you don't, your claims are forever barred. This is why probate's a good thing sometimes, right? Because probate brings finality to estates. It makes it so that things are done and nobody can come and create a problem afterwards. I'm going to hold on questions for right now. Thank you. And I'm going to come back to those. So that's a will. You tell the lawyer what you want. Lawyer puts it to paper in the proper form. There's lots of drafting tricks the lawyers can use to make things work right. And once that's done, you put it in a drawer, forget about it. And after death, your personal representative, what we call it in Florida, it's executor in most other states, takes that will to the lawyer and goes to court. Now, probate is often avoidable because here's another secret about wills that most people don't know. Most lawyers don't know. Wills only govern assets that are in your name alone when you die. Let me repeat that. Wills only govern assets that are in the decedent's name alone on death. This means that if I have joint accounts or accounts with beneficiary designations on them, those do not go according to my will. My will can say I leave everything to Temple Sinai, but if all of my uh, accounts say that it goes to Larry, Moe, and Curly or whomever, that's where it goes. It doesn't matter what I say in my will. Everybody got that? All right. So in other words, bank accounts and the way we title assets is really, really important. And it ends up more in control sometimes of an estate plan than what we say in our will. Okay. So that, in a nutshell, is a will. I'm going to come back to that. What's well, a trust? Think of a trust agreement as an artificial legal entity. 
okay? kind of like a corporation. So Sokoff Legal PA is my corporation. It owns my my space, my my building for my office. It owns my bank. It owns the table. It owns the chairs in my office. But I own the corporation, right? So I control. I don't own anything at the office. My corporation does. But I own the corporation. Same kind of thing with a trust agreement, really. If you think about it that way, it makes sense. You have this artificial legal entity, this trust, so I might have the Solkoff revocable trust. Revocable meaning I can change it at any time. I'm not locked in. And this trust will have two parts to it. And this is 99% of people who have trusts. This is the way it works. There's a while I'm alive part and an after I'm gone part. So we've already learned that wills cannot have a while I'm alive part. Right? They only go into effect after death and after probate. But a trust agreement can be effective upon signing, right? Why would I want that? What benefit would there be? Well, one big reason. If I become incapacitated, I want to know that my agents can step in and control everything without having unfettered access, because unfettered access, even if I trust them totally, could affect them if they have creditors, if they're going through a divorce, things like that. Whereas if they're a trustee or successor trustee of my trust, they can control things. They can hold the purse strings without the negatives of ownership, right? So that's one reason why a trust is really, really good because it has this while, while I'm alive, if I become incompetent part. And sadly, we know that many people become incapacitated before death. So we want to plan for that just in case it happens to us. Just, you know, I know this isn't fun to think about, but it, look, you know, when you plan, it brings you peace of mind so you don't have to worry about these things, right? We just have to acknowledge that they might happen and then deal with it. So that's where a trust agreement can help during lifetime as one example. After death part of the trust is just like a will. It says who gets what, okay? So wills, only effective upon death, must go through probate, take care of assets in my name alone when I die. Trusts, artificial legal entity like a corporation. It has a while I'm alive part and an after I'm gone part. And I can avoid probate because trusts don't die. People do. Right? So the trust doesn't die. It just keeps going. So that's the difference between wills and trusts. I'm gonna get more into these things. I just wanna give you the basics here. Next, a power of attorney is the document, one, probably the, it should have started with power of attorney because this is the most important legal document you can have. It is the document when you sign it, you're giving somebody that you tr trust the authority to stand in your shoes and do for you if you cannot do for yourself, right? Generally speaking, to be able to sign for you if you can't sign. That's effectively a power of attorney. Healthcare advanced directives. These are documents where you say what you want or don't want to happen for your healthcare in advance of needing those issues. That's why they're called healthcare advanced directives, healthcare directions you make in advance of needing them. And this includes most prominently a living will. This is where I say what I want or don't want. A healthcare surrogate designation, which is the person whom I name to enforce my living will, and a healthcare power of attorney, which is another person I appoint, usually the same person, by the way, just a different hat, but has different forces in the law. And then we talk about protective deeds. And I'm going to take questions in just a moment. We're going to talk about protective deeds later on in this conversation. What's important for you to know at this point is that most people, own their home in their names alone, or as husband and wife, or spouses, or usually it's like that. And that means upon the last to die on the will, that property has to go through some legal proceeding, and it may be subject to creditor claims. How many of you plan on having creditors? Well, hands went up. But of course, people do sometimes have creditors because healthcare creditors could come into play or the government could come into play, all kinds of things that you may not think about. And so one of the things that can be done with protective deeds 
is making sure that that home can pass properly to your desired beneficiaries without some of these dangers. And then there's long-term care planning. This is an umbrella term for thinking ahead about how you're going to pay for the cost of long-term care. What's long-term care? Home care, assisted living, or nursing home care? How many of you, just by show of hands, are anxious to go to a nursing home? No. So nobody wants to go to a nursing home. So the idea, right, is to plan to do whatever you can to stay as independent as possible. And this means making sure you understand the resources that are available to make that happen, right? That means bringing in help into the home, but how are you gonna pay for it? Um, you know, how, how do these things work? So planning ahead for long-term care becomes really critical. I think it's probably the thing that most affects people's quality of life and definitely their savings, right? So that's an important part of my field of elder law. All right, let's dig down these things. But before I do, any questions? Us? Yes. Yes. Okay, so I'm going to repeat the questions for those on Zoom. A pulsed is a physician's order for life-sustaining treatment, pulsed. And this is an, a type of advanced directive. It is not favored by lawyers and has not been uh, developed to a great extent in Florida. Now, the reason why there's a little bit of pull on this is that doctors and lawyers sometimes, we, we like each other, really we do, but sometimes there's a tension between the healthcare provider community and the rights of the individual. When you're a lawyer, you represent individuals, you represent people, and you are trying to get them to be able to manifest their own healthcare destiny, to decide for themselves what they wanna do. Rather than shoehorning them into a, a, a form. And if you are the ones that write the form, the American Medical Association and other organizations, you may have a different agenda than uh, just working for the individual. And in my opinion, the Pulse does not allow enough flexibility to people to actually articulate their wishes. And if we sat down today and actually did an exercise, and I've done this where we've spent four hours with groups talking about wishes going around the room, uh, we won't do that today, but uh, you'll find that as we delve into the issues, everybody's gonna have a slightly different take on things. So what where it comes into play is giving your surrogates as much authority as possible in your documents so that you've trusted, your trusted people can step in and take over the mantle for you without having to fit into a, a, a form that doctors have created. That's a blunt answer. Yes. How long does a will stay into effect? You can do a last will and testament um, at any time, and they're good forever, unless you change it. Yes. Great question. What's the difference between a healthcare surrogate designation and a healthcare power of attorney? A healthcare surrogate, there's a whole separate chapter in the Florida statutes, chapter 765, which deals with healthcare advanced decisions, including living wills and healthcare surrogate designations. There is a separate chapter of the Florida statutes, chapter 709, that deals with powers of attorney. Chapter 709, dealing with powers of attorney, has more teeth in it for enforcement provisions. So if a doctor or a hospital refuses to honor your advanced directives for any reason, we now have that same person often that's authorized as your healthcare surrogate who can take off their power of attorney hat and go to court if necessary in a much stronger way. Yes. I'll repeat your question afterwards. Oh. <laughs> 
I wanted to go back a minute to protective deeds. Uh, my mother had my name put onto her condo as a quit claim deed. And I did the same for my daughter when my husband was ill. So my daughter's name is on my condo with a quit claim deed. Giving So God bid anything happens to me, it becomes hers. Is that right? No. So what, what, uh, but I understand what you're saying and there's no one right answer for everybody. And this is why you have to talk to your lawyer before you know what's right for you. But I would say that typically when people quit claim their property away, there's uh, two big negatives that come to mind and then more. One is you have just made a gift of an asset, right? And making a gift of an asset has a negative tax consequence sometimes and always a negative effect on eligibility for certain need-based government programs like Medicaid to cover the cost of care. So um, what, because we have other ways of accomplishing the goals that you mentioned, um, it's best not to quick claim your property away usually. So there are other techniques that we're going to talk about today that you can do that are better than a quick claim deed, typically, right, for most people. And if you've already done a quick claim deed, how you can fix it. Yes. If if both of us make a will with you and both of us die at the same time, how does it get activated? Ah, well, now we get into advanced law. So the question is, what about simultaneous death statutes, Scott? Can I put a tack in that and come back to that? I'll bring you into my law school class. What it is, there, this, this happens. And wills actually have to talk about that and say, what if both people die at the same moment? Because you know that your will might say everything goes to my spouse and your spouse's will says everything goes to my spouse. So what do you do then? There are provisions that have to be put into wills and statutes that can be consulted to solve those problems. But without drilling down too far, that's enough for now. Yes. Yeah. Oh. HOLST stands for Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. Physician's Order for Life-Sustaining Treatment. If you want to know more about POLSTs, you can uh, uh, look on the internet regarding there's a not-for-profit that's been dealing with POLSTs um, that uh, you know many organizations have had a hand in. Um, it's, it's worth taking a look at. There's another document called Five Wishes, which is the most common document that, in terms of a form. Um, that's that's used. So your your goal as a as as an individual is to say, what do I want when I'm very, 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 very sick and I cannot communicate to the doctors? And this means if I can't lift my pinky, yes or no, who's going to do it for me? How do I draft that in the best way possible to accomplish my wishes while keeping them safe from liability? And I'm going to address that in a bit, too, so that you're drafting a document for you. Right. If you're if signing a document that has been drafted for you, you have to think about whether this accomplishes all of those goals. Okay, let's move along. Yeah. Okay. So I said that everybody's a little bit different. Everybody has their own issues. And I often, as a lawyer, you might imagine that one of the things that I often hear is so-and-so told me that you did this for them. I want that. Well, yeah, I mean, it might be the right thing for you, but probably not exactly the right thing for you. You have different children. You have different um, assets. Um, you may have different... Uh, uh, amounts of assets, different types of assets. You might have a different health care issue than that person had. Um, there may be some mental capacity issues that we're addressing or have to deal with. Um, single or, or widowed or, or married, I don't know. Um, married couples also have their own unique circumstances that have to be taken into consideration. And then married people with the same children and married people Different children have entirely different needs that we have to address. 
And then there are the circumstances, the family dynamics of children and agents. So I want to talk a little bit about this before we move along. In fact, I've been asked to specifically address some of these topics today. So first off, health and capacity. It's, again, not a fun thing to think about, but doing what I do, I started doing this today, not today, this year is the 30th anniversary of my being admitted to the Florida bar. You know, Thank you. I can't believe it's been that long. But when I first started out, I remember being so surprised at how prevalent dementia is. I, I was a relatively young guy and I just didn't know that it was so prevalent, but it is. And, and and now we know that more than ever. We're much more educated on dementia issues than 30 years ago. And so I think the key here is, hope it doesn't happen to me. If it does happen to me, I hope the progression is as slow as possible, that I can function as highly as possible, but I'd be an idiot not to plan for it. I'm getting the straight and dirty here. You have to plan ahead for those things that are so prevalent so that if it happens to you, you've got something to fall back on. Your wishes are going to be honored. You have as good a shot at remaining independent as possible. Some of this is legal work. Some of it is understanding what community resources exist so that you can reach out and get that help without scrambling at an emergency. All of these things really make a difference when I see who succeeds and who doesn't. Right. So a part of this is knowing and understanding your own health and your own capacity, but thinking ahead towards the future as well. Assets, nature and amount. Well, typically, if we're looking at um, I wanted to look at the exact number I have on my computer, the current federal estate tax exemption is thirteen point six one million dollars this year. That means that if you're over that amount, Call me, take me out for dinner, and we'll talk about how we can handle your estate. If you're under that amount, you do not have to worry about federal estate taxes. What is the estate tax rate for the Florida estate taxes? Zero. <laughs> That's right. It was a trick question. We have no state estate tax in Florida. Other states do. Right. So we know that as long as we are under that 13.61 million, we're OK for now. Now, that number is expected to go down, uh, but it's not going to go down that not, not not too far. Maybe about half of that is what we're expecting if it goes down at all. The other numbers to worry about, to think about, would be that. In terms of assets. Would be thinking ahead about how you're going to finance long term care. And I wish we had time today if we were to go around the room and really do this more individually and say, how do you plan on paying for home care, assisted living or nursing home care if and when you need it? Right. What would be your plan? So I'm just going to ask you to ask yourself that question and answer it. What's your plan? Because there's only three ways to pay. Your own savings and income, your own resources, long-term care insurance, which most people don't have or don't have enough of. And third would be need-based government benefits. Medicare does not cover long-term care. Your health insurance does not cover long-term care. The only government program that covers the cost of long-term care for most Americans is the Medicaid program. Now, Medicaid is a big umbrella term that means a lot of things. When most people hear the term Medicaid, they think of health insurance for the poor. That's not the type of Medicaid we're talking about. We're talking about Medicaid's long-term care programs, which are separately administered, separate rules, separate caseworkers. It's a very different program. Medicaid health insurance for the poor is not a very successful system but Medicaid's long-term care insurance is. Did you know that here in Florida, if I needed, if I had to, had to, had to go to a nursing home, I can even get into the Rolls Royce of nursing homes on Medicaid, that Medicaid covers the whole bill? Less my income, I have to pay my income, but the government pays the whole, the whole thing, and even the best. So 
you don't qualify for Medicaid, though, unless you're broke. That's the trick. What does broke mean? You have to be below $2,000 in assets. It's a very generous system. So this means, what does the government want you to do? Spend everything. Spend everything so that you've saved and saved and saved for your retirement. You spend everything. Then you go on Medicaid. Okay. The problem, of course, then, it would be a, a workable system, except for the fact that now I am solely reliant on the government dole. I have nothing left over of what I worked for to pay for all the things Medicaid is not going to cover. I'm on my own I, and, and solely reliant on the government saying yes or no to what they'll pay for. If they don't cover it, I'm, I'm, I'm out of luck. And because money buys care, this is a very big issue and it, literally a life and death issue, certainly a quality of life issue. So the idea is to plan ahead and say, okay, if the government says I can only have $2,000 in assets, what are they allowed to count? And what are they not allowed to count? This is the way lawyers think. What does asset mean? <laughs> where, where does this $2,000 number come from? And how can we work that? What do the federal laws say? What do the state laws say? Because Medicaid is both. And we use state laws against federal laws and federal laws against state laws. And how do we make all of this work? And that is where my father and several other lawyers started to make headway in the early 1980s because their clients were coming to them with this problem. And instead of saying, I can't help you, they figured it out and developed the whole system. And that system is still in play all over the country with elder law attorneys in every state now. And so what that means is that there are legal methods, legal ethical methods of protecting your assets so that you're taking countable assets that the government would count against you and rendering them non-countable using the government's own rules and laws. How about that? So that's long-term care planning, and it's something that you should consider when you ask yourself, how am I going to pay for all of this care, right? Now, you may have heard about look-back periods. I have to do this within a certain amount of time. Well, that's kind of true, but not full story. The government says that if you have assets and you give them away, don't come crying to us. We're going to look back five years to determine whether you made any gifts. So the only reason why we'd make gifts in planning from a legal standpoint is if we feel confident, comfortable that we've got five years before we need long-term care, or that we have enough resources to self-finance during that five years, or maybe some long-term care insurance and other things so these are the types of things, again, reasons why everybody's plan is different, right? We're getting back to assets and capacity and all of those issues. And that also leads us to the next issue, which is circumstances of children and agents. Are our children trustworthy, thrifty, wise, and prudent? Are our in-laws trustworthy, thrifty, wise, and prudent? Because sometimes in-laws can influence our children. And we have to think about all of these things. And sometimes as your lawyer, your lawyer has to think about these things for you because you may be uncomfortable talking about these things or thinking about them even. It's tough. So these are the kinds of things you talk about with your lawyer in privacy. And you say, yeah, I got three kids, but this one, you know, you really have to have that conversation. So uh, married, married people, uh, can do special planning that non-married people can't just because of the way the laws are set up. The laws encourage generally encouraged marriage or some big penalties too, but you know that. So if, if you're married, you can move assets between each other, typically without any negative consequence for taxes or for Medicaid or things like that. So that can be a big help sometimes in your planning. There's an interesting tool now. So we, now that you've heard about a long-term care plan, so you got that in your head, right? So let's say I have a client who comes to me, and I'm just going to use a, a pretend number. Let's say they have $600,000 in assets plus their condominium in Kings Point. And all of those assets are counted against them for Medicaid eligibility purposes. The home can be exempt. I'm not going to get into why, but 
$600,000 is certainly countable. So what do we do? We're going to legally take those assets and using the government's own rules and laws, make it so that even though the clients don't necessarily have to give up any control of their assets or make gifts, they can be non-countable. We show the government everything that we've done. We're not hiding anything and we're good to go. So let's say it's a married couple and one spouse needs care and we get that spouse on Medicaid. We're saving tens or hundreds of thousands of dollars because we did that, right? Because the government's paying for that care. We're not getting anything we don't deserve. We're, we're, we're getting what we need. So we've got that money for that spouse. What happens if the well spouse who has all the money dies before the ill spouse? The ill spouse generally is going to inherit all that money and it's not going to help him or her. It's going to hurt them because now they're going to lose their Medicaid and what's worse is have to pay the government back. So for married people, there's a special kind of a will and trust combination that allows for a protected trust to be created upon the death of the first spouse, the well spouse in this example, where the assets cannot be counted against the ill spouse who is already on Medicaid. This is a special kind of a trust agreement only available between spouses and only done to protect against Medicaid issues. Now, we don't know when we're well and fine whether we're going to need that or not. But if you set everything up right, it's only a protection and never a disadvantage. You may never need to use it. But if you do need to use it and the person's on Medicaid, we've just saved, again, hundreds of thousands of dollars. It's not a small matter. So, again, only available for married couples, but a very good tool. Um, let's talk about married people in second or further marriages for a moment. I know this doesn't apply to everybody, but I want you to hear this. And if you have friends in this circumstance, this is good fodder for um, conversation over wine. Let's say that... Um, I have a new spouse who has her own children and I have my children. When I die, you know, money does crazy things to people. Sometimes I see some, some giggles. Yes, we know this. And so because money can do crazy things to people, even people we trust and love, sometimes, you know, th things can go wrong. So we try as the lawyer to say, even though these are good kids, and even though you as spouses have a good, solid marriage, let's just plan to be safe that something goes wrong somewhere, right? Because good lawyering, the way I've been taught, is to think about everything that can go wrong and to plan for that. So one thing that people with different children can do is lock into an estate plan with each other, reach an agreement while they're well and fine and say, what do we want to happen? How do we want this to go? If you go first, what, how do we want things to go? If you go first, how do we want things to go? Have a real heart to heart about it. And, and you can blame me for this conversation and say, you know, I, I want to make sure that we get this taken care of. I trust you. I trust the kids. You know, if, if you don't be honest about that, too. And say, let's get this knocked out. And then you talk to your lawyer and you say, here's what we're thinking. Is there anything we haven't thought about? Can we what what sh what can we do to make this happen? So that's locking into an estate plan. And typically the way that's done is we create a revocable plan that's there while you're both okay. But if there is incapacity that encroaches or death, the plan can lock down. It becomes irrevocable at that point. The benefit of this is if I start becoming hazy and somebody's whispering in my spouse's ear, typically sometimes I have to say it, it's the children of the other spouse. This is what happens. And whispering in that, my spouse's ear saying, listen, you know, you're entitled to this, you know, and, you know, that's the way these things happen in real life. 
I know I sound jaded, but I've been doing this for 30 years. Remember that. So it's a good idea to plan for that and make sure that everything's going to be okay, regardless of who's whispering in whose ears, okay? So that's a thought. Hello? Yes, now's a good time for questions. Yes. What kind of veterans benefit passed to my spouse if I die? Did you serve during time of war? Yes. Okay. Thank you for your service. Oh, I'm not kidding. So the, the, uh, the, the question is, is I'm a veteran. Well, what type of veterans benefits might pass to my spouse? So I'll be very brief on this because there are many, and I would direct your attention to the website, va.gov, which is surprisingly good uh, for a government website. It's very nice to navigate, and there's a lot of information on there. Now, uh, the big benefit from my perspective as an elder law attorney is there is a pot of money available in the VA for wartime veterans served during time of conflict and uh, that they can get about $2,500, $2,600 a month towards unreimbursed care expenses like a home health aid or assisted living facility. And yes, this can be inherited. The spouse surviving, surviving spouse because they married the right guy or gal get that benefit too. Um, it's a different number, but it's a very good benefit. You're welcome. Yes. Scott, I want to follow up on that. The Korean conflict had some gray area with regard to spousal benefits. So can you speak on that? So the Korean conflict has spousal benefits now, no longer an issue. Um, you know, there's interesting, what's interesting about the wartime issue is the times that they, the, the dates that Congress has set, you know, for the beginning of conflict and the end of conflict. So they're actually broader than you might think. You may think that you didn't serve during time of war, but you might have. That's, and by the way, with the uh, closing of the Gulf Wars, we now have the largest class of veterans in American history, wartime veterans. Yes. And also their spouse, anyone who served and also their spouse is entitled for free burial at the VA cemetery here on 441. That's any vet and their spouse. Is, and there is a small stipend to cover the cost of the funeral itself. That's in addition to what you mentioned. And then I have another question. You said that up to $2,500, because I've been taking notes, would be available to anyone who served in wartime. So here's the question. What if you served during, let's say, the Vietnam War, but you weren't... Um, in active combat, you were a clerk in the military, or you were a medic, um, or you were in the home front, but it was during mil during a military campaign. Does that still apply? The question is, uh, is this going into the zone so I don't have to repeat it? Okay, good. My expert says yes. So the, the answer is that the uh, it doesn't matter where you serve. Your contribution uh, as, as uh, sweeping floors it was just as important, it, well, it's it's given the same credence as a person in the trenches, absolutely. The only, the only uh, difference on that, pardon me, was Vietnam. Uh, Vietnam does have an interesting issue, and that is at the beginning of the conflict near Gulf of Tonkin, there is a uh, provision that did require in-country, but for most of it and for all the other conflicts, there is no issue. Yes. What I wanted to say was that I know that people who are VA eligible also can go into VA nursing homes if it's necessary, and they don't have to pay anything for that. Yes, there's wonderful VA benefits. Now, most of my clients, the VA facility here in, in Riviera Beach is, is very nice, and, and West Palm, very, very nice. Um, but most of my clients, if given their druthers, would prefer to be in facilities either that are closer approximately to themselves or their family or their friends, or uh, they feel are nicer. But uh, And you can do that and get it compensated anyway if you do your proper planning. So let's move along, and I'm, I'll take some other questions in a bit. 
Any questions about this slide though, before I move on? Any other questions? Okay, I got more good stuff for you. So if you think about what do I need? How do I set things up the right way? I know it can be confusing. Do I need a will or trust? Should I have a power of attorney? Should Do I need a living will? All of those issues. So I'm gonna tell you, this is the plan that most people need, right? Most people is important to underline that and bold it because you should talk to your lawyer to make sure that it's what you require. So a power of attorney, which waives self-dealing and authorizes asset protection, blanket statements of authority, everything I can do, you can do are not enough. Why? What do I mean by this? If I give you a power of attorney and you're my agent, the law is seeking to protect me so that you can't run off with my money. So there are conflict of interest rules, and there's a specific law that says that the agent cannot enter into transactions with themselves, with my money, right? Because they're my agent, and they're in a trusted role, and that shouldn't be allowed. And that's generally what the law says. So regular powers of attorney, in fact, almost all powers of attorney, your agents cannot self-deal. There might be some exceptions built into those powers of attorney. The usual exception would be that my agent, if they were my children, can gift to themselves under the gift tax exemption amount, so you might see that. But if you're thinking ahead about long-term care planning, you want to talk to your lawyer about whether it makes sense to waive the self-dealing prohibition in the power of attorney so that your agent, which is often your trusted child, who is eventually is going to be your trustee, your personal representative anyway, if they're allowed to be able to do transactions with themselves, so long as it remains in your best interest for them to do so, right? So there, are, there's language that, that attorneys can use to modify typical powers of attorney, God bless you, to allow for greater flexibility. So that's an example of uh, how you make that power of attorney work for you. And for most people, this is after a conversation with an elder law attorney, this is what they usually do, right? Healthcare advanced directives. Everybody over the age of 18 should have a living will and a healthcare surrogate designation and a healthcare power of attorney, right? You too. Trust and or will. So we talked about trust and wills at the beginning of the presentation. Did you know that when you have a trust agreement, you also still have a will? Why? I have a trust agreement. The trust says who gets what. Why would I need a will? Anybody know? It's a tough one. Um, a trust is in force all the time from the time that you sign for the trust. There must be certain assets or certain things that should be handled by a will rather than by a trust. Oh, you're on the right track. Okay. So the answer is that your trust, just like Solkoff Legal PA owns the table and owns the space and, you know, it has to own things in order for it to be worthwhile, in order for it to work. The corporation owns nothing. It's, it is it is nothing. It's an empty shell. Same thing with your trust agreement. The trust agreement must own the assets in order to control those assets. So that's why if I have a trust, I have to retitle my assets into the name of my trust. And lawyers have a way of making this happen. Now, what if I have an asset that I didn't title into the name of my trust? I forgot about it or I come into an asset later and I don't do it, some mistake happens, or I come into an asset, maybe I have a kind of asset that can't be put into a trust. Maybe I get into a car accident, God forbid, something bad happens to me, and my lawsuit is an asset, right? Things like that could happen. So the will is there as an emergency backup. That's all it is. It's there just in case there is something left in my name alone when I die that was not able or did not get into my trust agreement. It's a special kind of a will called a pour over will, P-O-U-R, pour over will, because all it says is if there's something left in my name alone when I die, it shall 
pour over into my trust. And then the trust says who gets what anyway, you see? So for most people, trust agreements in Florida are very, very common. They're very common because the probate process in Florida is more burdensome than most, and it's expensive. So if we can avoid probate through the use of a trust agreement, it, it often makes sense to do. Not for everybody. This depends also on the nature and amount of assets, family issues, and other things. But it's, it's certainly worth exploring uh, for you. And then there's the protective deed I told you I would come back to. Yes, the protective deed. And we talked about long-term care asset protection planning. So I have a whole slide on the deed and how to protect your home. After this, I'll pause for some more questions. So first of all, you should know that one of the things that we have to be very proud of in Florida is our homestead protections. They are the strongest in the country. Your home is your castle. Nobody can take your home. No creditors. Very, very few exceptions. So what this means to us is we don't want to lose our homestead protection in Florida because creditors could take the home. That's the constitutional part of our homestead. Then there's a statutory part of our homestead that gives us a discount on our property taxes. That's what most people know about. And you don't want to lose that either. Right. So in order to make the home remain our homestead, our primary home, we also want to keep the home non-countable for Medicaid eligibility purposes, just in case you want Medicaid in the future, because it's such a big pot of money for long-term care. For most people, you'd want to plan for that. So there are ways to keep it non-countable. And we want to keep the home from getting attached by creditors. We want to keep the homestead creditor protection. We want to avoid probate. And so there's two common ways of doing this. One way is to transfer the property into a trust agreement. And this is very common. Another way is through the use of a special kind of a deed called a ladybird deed. A ladybird deed. And a ladybird deed, very interesting. It says, and I'm proud to say, I won't tell you the whole story, but my father is the progenitor of the Lady Bird Deed, and it's used all over the country. Lots of articles about this. The Lady Bird Deed is a special kind of a deed that says, I own the property for the rest of my life. It is mine to do with whatever I wish. I'm going to put my kids' names on the deed, or my beneficiary, whomever that may be, on the deed. But they're only a beneficiary. They have no say over whether I can sell my home, whether I want to rent my home, whether I want to burn it down. They're not in charge. They, I am. That's a lady bird deed. And if we do that, we avoid a probate proceeding because immediately in the moment of the last to die, it automatically goes to the named beneficiaries on that deed. And I get all these benefits. I keep all my benefits of homestead. So it's a common tool now that we use uh, more times than not. Sometimes a deed goes into a trust and it can be the right thing for that family if we're not worried about creditors or Medicaid or other reasons that we use trusts. And this depends on your circumstances. Okay, any questions thus far? Yes, and back. What happens to the basis of a property with a ladybird? Are you trying to stump me? <laughs> so <laughs> this is a good question. Um, what happens with the basis on a ladybird deed? So what this gentleman is asking is if I have a property and I'm going to sell it or there's going to be a transaction, won't the government want a piece of it? Because typically I have to pay taxes on any gain that I sell. So, for example, if I sell my home today and I bought it for 50000 and it's worth 500000 I have to pay taxes on the 450000 unless I fall into an exception, which most people do, by the way. Okay? But if I uh, do this deed and I transfer this future interest, is what it's called in the law, to my children as beneficiaries, 
injuries, will I lose my stepped up basis, my ability to pass that on at death at that cost? And the answer is I do not lose that basis. And the reason why I don't lose that basis is I haven't made a completed gift. So for our beneficiaries, our children, they get advantage of the stepped up. Is that correct? Yes. It does step up. The value of the property steps up when I die. So they don't have to pay extra tax, basically. That's, that's exactly right. Is that the same for the trust? The answer is yes. Scott, on the Lady Bird deed, if you designate your children as beneficiaries, do they have to have equal amounts or can you designate percentages? You can designate percentages. What if you're an only child and what if you have an only child? That was my situation. I'm an only child. When my mother passed and I was on the quit claim deed, I owned her condo. So I have that for my daughter because she's an only child. There's no one else. Her name is on the condo. So whether you're an only child or you have, uh, or there are five siblings, it doesn't change anything I've just said. Everything stays the same. So really good idea to talk to your lawyer and see if these kinds of planning steps would be right for you. Okay, suppose you have a disabled child. Disabled child is not able to handle finances. And you've made arrangements in your will for there to be an amount equal to a third of the estate for the disabled child. And you have named the beneficiaries of who shall handle the disabled child's portion of the estate. Does the disabled child uh, lose Medicaid or anything else because this money is set aside for that child? What a wonderful question. So the, the, the answer is maybe. How's that for a lawyer's answer? So the, 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 there is a special kind of a trust agreement, special kinds of language that lawyers now use to protect the assets of people with disabilities in trust agreements. And these, this, these are known as special needs provisions. So typically, with the, the, where the danger is, is let's say that I have a child with a disability, and that child is receiving need-based government benefits like disability payments from the government, SSI, or, and or Medicaid. If that be the case, they could lose their money if they inherit money from me, right? And this is very common. And by the way, for those of you that think this may not apply to you, you may have, again, lawyers have to think about everything that can go wrong, right? What if I have a child, grandchild, great-grandchild that becomes disabled, right? So we have to think about these kinds of issues. And the language that we might include in a trust agreement can make it so that the government can't count those assets against eligibility. So that is held aside and can be managed by another trustee, another child or another professional trustee. And that's a very important issue. Scott, just one more on that Lady Bird, right here, back in the back. <laughs> it's the third microphone. Just okay. following up on that Lady Bird deed, um, for that to take effect, do both spouses have to pass or if one is, is still alive, is no, Lady Bird deed has no uh, bearing at that point. So let's say it's um, it's uh, John and Mary. We we do the deed. Let's say John and Mary own their home as as spouses right now. John and Mary to John and Mary. Remainder we say, which is beneficiaries, to the children, and so John and Mary own that home as spouses still during their lifetimes. And upon the last to die, then it passes to the beneficiaries. Scott? Okay. Yeah. Does it make any 
difference if our beneficiaries live here in Florida or maybe not even in the country? The answer is yes, it could. Um, it, if they are United States citizens and they're in the they're in America, receiving that property as a beneficiary has no special significance. It's then they decide what they're going to do with it. That's really not an issue. But receiving an asset, inheriting an asset overseas for an overseas resident could have negative tax consequences in their country of origin. So that is something that we sometimes have to think about. A home. Let's say they inherit your home. Well, here, because we are homesteaded, I understand that there's no tax liability for the state, for them with regard to the state. What if they lived in a state which doesn't have um, um, that kind of protection for the citizen? Do you follow what I'm saying? Yes, there's, there's, um, you know, I should say that I'm not a tax advisor. Okay. I usually have a neon sign. I forgot to bring it today. I am not a tax advisor. I'm not qualified to render tax advice. I should talk to an accountant to make sure. But my understanding is that there's no negative tax consequence, regardless of where in America that child lives. But overseas, there could be. So, for example, I have many clients whose children or grandchildren live in Israel, and we have to consider the negative tax consequences in Israel for how that property would be dealt with. Yeah. Very. I just want to follow up on the special needs trust. Um, if the child does not live in Florida and lives in another location, is there any impact if you're a resident of Florida and have a special needs trust for a child or grandchild? Whether that child lives in or out of Florida or whether you live in or out of Florida doesn't change it. Um, these are um, nationally accepted uh, drafting techniques. Thank you. So let's let's move on. Great questions. Okay, so what about irrevocable? Is there a, anybody that has an irrevocable trust? Irrevocable. Most people don't. Okay, okay. Okay, most people have revocable, revocable trust, right? So because irrevocable means you give up your control, right? So we wouldn't want to give up our control unless it was a real good reason to do so, right? Well, one good reason we talked about earlier is that if I'm in a second or further marriage and I want to lock into an estate plan and make sure that everything's going to be okay, I might say, let's have a revocable agreement, but upon the first of us to become incapacitated or die, our plan locks in, right? Then whatever we've decided is going to be the deal. That's one reason why irrevocable trusts might be created. There's another reason. The most common reason that I see is in a long-term care planning context. So if I'm looking to shelter my assets to protect them against Medicaid eligibility or for Medicaid eligibility so that I can qualify, I might want to get assets out of my name. Now, I mentioned before how we have ways to get around the five-year look-back period. That's typically what we're doing is getting around the five-year look-back period because by the time people come to me for this, they don't have five years. They, they, they want their benefits now, right? But for people that come to me in advance or who have resources, we could create an irrevocable trust, transfer assets into that irrevocable trust, give up control on purpose, but know that now those assets are out of our name. It can't be counted against us as assets. We gotta wait five years because it's a gift into the trust. But for some people, this makes a lot of sense. In, Amer in Florida, we can be very aggressive in Medicaid planning. We can get around the five-year look back period for most people. In most states, that's not the case. And so this is the most common planning tool throughout the country for Medicaid planning strategies. Whereas in Florida, we don't use this all the time. We use this for people that have long-term care insurance or other um, assets and resources or are well and fine when they come to us. But you should know about this tool. It's a good tool. It allows you to get assets out of your name and into the children's control, typically in a way where the government really it's controlled in a safe as, as safe as possible way. A very good technique. Yes, question. Beneficiaries, name beneficiaries in our will, okay? Those beneficiaries died. Does the beneficiaries' wills then take over those rights? 
No. So if I, in my last will and testament, I mean, if, if, if you did your job right, no. If I, in my last will and testament, say everything goes to so-and-so, I should darn well make sure that my will also says, if so-and-so dies before me, here's what happens. I think that would be malpractice to do otherwise. So that way you're controlling where those assets go. Otherwise, yeah, they go to so-and-so's estate and could go to anybody. Your money. Yeah. And you may not be able to change your will because you may be incompetent at the time. So it's very important to get that done right. Okay. So that's the irrevocable trust. That's how that works. And we use irrevocable trusts quite commonly because we can put assets into this trust, again, to qualify for Medicaid eligibility. And we don't have to put all of our assets in. So if I have a client with a million dollars, I might put in, and we, we actually go work together to see how much money do we need liquid in your name? How much money do you feel comfortable giving up control over to the kids? And you put that money into the irrevocable trust. It's not the children's money, right? It's the trust's money. But by doing this, you get that money out of your name for Medicaid eligibility purposes, and that can have a very big benefit, saving hundreds of thousands of dollars. Yeah. Will with you 15 years ago. How frequently should we meet with you to make sure that the will provisions still apply with all the state and federal laws change? So it's a good idea to touch base with the law firm at least once every five years, three to five years is the saying, um, just to see if everything's okay. And sometimes that can just be a phone call to the lawyer just to touch base. Um, sometimes it's a good idea actually to come in and sit down for an hour and talk about what's going on with the kids, what's going on with your health. And the lawyer may be able to divine information from you that you might not think is so important that may affect your planning. Yeah. I'm going to speak yes. for myself. If you formed a trust with a legal advice more than 30 years ago and have been sitting on it, do something about it. Yes. And uh, moving right along, we're almost done with this presentation. Yes. Uh, when you put in an irrevocable trust, do you then lose the ability to sell that asset completely? Or do your the, the trustees have can still sell it? Right. So generally speaking, when you put an asset into the irrevocable trust as we've defined it, you give up control to control that asset. The trustees uh, may and usually are given control to sell those assets. So, so it still can be sold as long as oh, yeah. the trustees agree to it. Yes. And you get the Medicare benefit. Yes. Okay. Special considerations for most widows and widowers. So first off, many people lose their spouse and don't make any changes to their planning. Oftentimes that's a mistake because we need to think ahead about who's going to take care of things for us if now that our spouse is gone, who's going to step in and help out? So it's really thinking about a trusted person or persons who can be relied upon to be able to step into those roles and take care of things. And it's not, by the way, always the children. Sometimes the child or children are not the best people to put into that, that role. Um, you may know this, but feel guilty not doing it. And this, this is what I sometimes see. And you have to and I, I take it, I get that. I do. I'm a parent. I get it. But but it's very important to think about practically what's going to happen and what are your goals. So these are the kind of issues you can talk with your lawyer about. Locking in an estate plan. We talked about that. Protection from future relationships or things like that. If I don't have that locked in estate plan with my spouse, um, my spouse could remarry the pool guy who she always admired. And then everything goes to the pool guy's children for, you know, that's, that would, could, could, and does happen. So you want to talk about this as a couple and say, let's, you know, make sure everything's okay. Tax considerations and administering decedents estate plan. 
So again, we've talked about the federal estate tax exemption. Of course, if we're approaching the estate tax exemption amount, whatever that is in the year that you're uh, you know, doing your planning, you have to start thinking about how to protect your estate from excess estate taxation. And that becomes very important too, because the estate tax is very high, um, a, a big tax. So we're talking about typically millions of dollars in tax for people that are at that level. And there are planning techniques that can be used to help. Um, and then there's administering the decedent's estate plan. So my goal when I die is to make sure that my wishes are given full legal effect as efficient as possible so that my children don't have to deal with a whole bunch of problems. And that means that if I can use a trust instead of a will and have them avoid a six-month delay and more attorney's fees and all that, I want to do that. If I can do this deed that's going to make pass automatically, I'm going to do that. I want to try and think about the things that are going to make things easier. And this also deals with simplifying my assets. If I have 30 different bank accounts, maybe I want to think about consolidating. You know, um, So it, there are different things that can be done. You can talk about this with your lawyer as well. And we've already talked about long-term care asset protection planning. Um, I do whole presentations on this. We have many articles on our website if you're interested in more, but uh, that's an important issue that if you already haven't planned for that you want to think about. Oh, it's working again. Special considerations for most married couple. Again, you need to make sure that you've got the right trusted people authorized to act for you. This is usually a spouse and or children, but it doesn't have to be. Consider locking in the estate plan upon the first to die, as we've discussed. We've talked about long-term care asset protection planning in that spousal protection trust. Remember, that's what I said about if one spouse dies before the spouse is already on Medicaid, we don't want that person losing their Medicaid. All that money is going to be gone. So we have these special protected trusts that we create. And to remarry or marry. So there are, there are couples who are not married, who are contemplating marriage or not sure, um, talk to your lawyer. There are disadvantages and benefits to marriage is a legal construct and civilly in the civil side. And in, in, in the temple side, we have a religious ceremony and we go through halakha and make sure that we've married our Bashir and we talk about our ketubah and our promises to each other. But government wise, it's not like that. There, there is a there are statutes that say this is now what hap has happened to you. And you should know what those things are. They're good and bad. So talk to your lawyer. The goal is to be worry-free. Scott. And that's a picture of my father, for those of you that had not, never met him uh, in the upper left-hand corner there. Yes. Uh, question. When you're talking about the spousal protection plan, what if you're talking about a single parent with kids? Is there a way to protect to protect assets from Medicaid for the children? Yes. So the spousal protection trust is, um, the reason I highlighted that today is our talk was more in the estate planning realm. And that's a tool that we use as a will and trust combo for only for married couples though. But are there techniques for a single person to protect their assets against the cost of long-term care? Absolutely. Absolutely. So that's it for today. I want to thank you very much for participating as much as you did. Hi, Mom. Um, I don't think there's anyone here who hasn't learned something new. Um, I don't know if you could see me, but I was sitting in the front with his handout and scribbling uh, like crazy to take notes down for things that I don't know and I've never even heard of. And I hope that everybody here has been doing the same because I don't know anybody, Scott, who's better qualified to speak on elder care than you are. And I'm sure that I speak for the audience when I say that I believe everyone in this room has learned something new about the need to prepare for the future, no matter how long or short it may be. Scott, we want to thank you for coming out to speak to us today. And we hope 
We hope you will join with your fellow congregants for dessert and refreshments in a few minutes. Excuse me. Our final lecture of the season will take place on Sunday, May the 19th, as in, and is in commemoration of Yom HaShoah, which took place, um, which will have taken place a bit earlier. We are honored to have as our speaker a hidden child of the Holocaust. Uh, she's coming up from Broward County with her daughter. Uh, she is um, um, obviously has been alive uh, since before the war and uh, she was hidden in Belgium. So I hope you will all come out and encourage your friends to come out and hear about her experience. Until then, Jane and I would like to wish everyone here and everyone watching on Zoom a happy and zis sweet Pesach or Passover. Okay, thank you. And now let's everybody go and get some goodies. Thank you.